Stanford University. Well, I'm delighted to have a chance to talk about our research here today and say a few words about what we're doing and with the help and support of the Woods Institute. Um, I'm an environmental engineer, and my specialty is biotechnology for clean water, uh, clean energy, and clean materials. And, uh, but I want to illustrate uh, what, what the Woods Institute is doing uh, in terms of collaborations uh, through the people I'm working with. So one person we're working with is uh, Frank Willock from the Department of Economics. And we're looking at ways to short circuit the water cycle, which I'll explain uh, a little bit later what that means. Another, uh, two other people we're working with are Sarah Billington, who's a structural engineer, and uh, Kurt Frank, who's a chemical engineer. So you get an idea of the kind of diversity that we have in, the, in these different uh, initiatives. And then uh, lastly, here's Brian Cantwell, who's literally a rocket scientist. Now, what's an environmental engineer doing with a rocket scientist, right? Uh, that's an interesting question. So I'm going to try and explain a little bit of that, uh, each one of these things, give you some idea of what we're up to. So first of all, when I talk about short-circuiting the water cycle, uh, we can think of it as just a simple cycle of high-quality, low-quality water. And what we've been really good at as human beings is this, taking uh, high-quality water and making it into low-quality water. And uh, that's how we've short-circuited the cycle uh, right now, so far very effectively. And as a result, we have uh, situations like this one in Bangladesh where communities are, uh, are discharging wastewater directly to their drinking water supplies, okay, directly. And uh, so, of course, we need to reverse that. And so uh, we need a similar short circuit to reverse the process that's, that we're seeing here. And that's uh, one of our uh, focuses of our effort. So I want to just introduce you to the water cycle, the way we do it nowadays is we take water from rivers and lakes, and, and usually there's long transport involved, and it costs a lot to pump the water like that, high energy demands. We treat it with a lot of chemicals, or we could pump it up from an aquifer at great expense as well through pumping. And then uh, we're left with wastewater. <clears throat> now, wastewater typically in the United States, we're treating it aerobically, which is a very energy intensive process. We end up with a lot of sludge that has to be disposed of. And then ultimately, the water then would be discharged to a river or lake, and it may infiltrate into the aquifers. Uh, it may go to the ocean. The cycle gets completed through evapotranspiration and uh, precipitation when driven by the sun. So that's the cycle we live with. Uh, that's how we get our fresh water now. Can we do better than that? That's the question. And so if we look at wastewater, instead of thinking of it uh, in the uh, negative sense all the time, let's think about what resources are there that might be useful. First of all, water, wastewater is mainly water, 99.9% .9 water. And it's also got biodegradable organics in it. You know what those are. And it's got nutrients, right? Nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are all useful things, potentially. Uh, it also has a bunch of bad stuff that we've got to get rid of, things like pathogens and salt, uh, refractory organics. Those need to be dealt with. But there's resources there. There's value to be found in wastewater. And so if you look at the value of this resource, I've got this little table here summarizing uh, the results of Willy Verstraat's work. Uh, Willy is uh, a Belgian engineer, and he, uh, he, he wrote this up in euros, and I did the very sophisticated conversion to dollars. Okay, So what you see here is organic soil conditioner could be recovered. That's like compost, right? And if you convert it over U.S. dollars per thousand gallons, uh, from a, you know, we're basically saying, what is the value of that wastewater? It's about 10 cents for every thousand gallons that you could recover as compost. Methane uh, would be useful as energy, right? Uh, that can be recovered from the organics and wastewater, about 25 cents, 1,000 gallons. Uh, nitrogen, the same level, uh, and phosphorus, a little less. And then the water is the big winner. It really pays to get water out of wa wastewater. A buck 20 is the value of that resource uh, per every 1,000 gallons. Okay, so there's the big winner. Now, one thing we're looking at is uh, an economic analysis of, op of ways to drive down the cost of recovering uh, good, clean water from wastewater. Now, <clears throat> when we talk, here's like a sewer. You can imagine this sewer uh, running along El Camino, for example. And uh, you could potentially pull wastewater out of there, remove the carbon from it, and you're left now with the nitrogen and the, and, and the nutrients still. But uh, you can get the carbon out, and there might be ways to do that very cheaply. That's what we want to investigate. Put them right back in the sewer. And then take that water and use it for non-potable applications, potentially things like landscape or agriculture. And, of course, it would have to be disinfected and treated properly for that, uh, those purposes. But just by getting carbon out efficiently, you could do that. You could also take out the nitrogen 
and phosphorus, put those back in the sewer, for example. And then the water becomes useful for higher quality applications, things like washing clothes, flushing toilets. And then we could even take the salt out, and the salt could go back to the sewer. And then the water becomes useful for aquifer storage, for cooling, uh, for ecosystem restoration. So let's, one, one place where we could begin is with close to home. So we've, uh, we've been meeting with uh, uh, people at the Stanford Utilities Group. Um, Tom Zichterman leads that effort on water, reuse, on water uh, plans for the campus. And one option would be scalping. Okay, so if we did the scalping, we could potentially recover non-potable water for use uh, on the campus. Recovery of water at a dollar per thousand gallons would be a good goal. Faculty and staff at, um, in the faculty staff area right now pay four dollars per thousand gallons for water that's mostly used for irrigating their properties. Four dollars per thousand gallons, but we might be able to get a dollar. Okay. So now if you get widespread scalping, so not just say at Stanford, but say at Los Altos Hills or other places as well in the community that, ser that is uh, served by the city of Palo Alto, you'd end up changing the centralized facility and how it operates. So let's imagine this. You have distributed systems, and what I'm showing here is a, a collection system for collecting wastewater. And you could imagine putting scalping facilities at di different locations, cleaning up the water, and recovering that resource, using, harvesting that water and using it locally at low cost. Okay? That means you don't have to bring in, import, and pay for high quality, waste, high quality water for that application. Okay? The salt could be discharged back to the river and, say, out to the ocean. Now, if you did that, and if we recovered three-fourths of the water out of the wastewater that way, then you're left with one quarter of the water, so it concentrates everything else. So now if we look at the resource value of this wastewater that's concentrated, look what's happened. Now the nitrogen is worth a buck per every thousand gallons, and the methane is also worth a buck for every thousand gallons when it arrives at the centralized treatment facility. So we've just changed the value of the resource. Okay, so now we can think about centralized facilities that are different from what we've seen in the past, where the goal is to harvest energy and nutrients at the centralized facilities. And so uh, this is something that we're really excited about, and we want to look at the economics of this, and we think there's a lot of potential here. So there we go. Now I want to talk about short-circuiting short the carbon cycle. Just a couple of slides. It's okay, Lynn. So this one is, uh, right now, you know, this is our, my version of the carbon cycle, very simple-minded. We've got fixed carbon, and then we've got our gaseous carbon. Uh, carbon dioxide, for example, or methane, or the gaseous carbon. And we humans are really good at doing this, taking fixed carbon, say in, in plant matter, for example, or coal, and burning it, right, and making gaseous carbon out of it. We're really good at it. We've short-circuited that cycle so effectively that we've, we've done this, right? Uh, we've left the polar bear with nowhere to swim, or nowhere to, nowhere to sit, I should say. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this is the problem, and so how do we deal with this? How do we, well, we've got to short circuit it going back the other way, right? That's one way to deal with it. And so how, what kind of technology could we envision? We're on target. So here's one. Uh, let's suppose that we have a, this is, a, this is the biocomposites um, work that we're doing and bioplastics work. And I'll see if I can just use my pointer here to follow, we can follow through this. Here's an anaerobic uh, a landfill where you're producing biogas, methane biogas, okay? And the methane, we found that you can, you, there's microorganisms that can use that methane as their food. And if you grow them under the right conditions, they'll accumulate a bioplastic inside the microbes. That's PHB there, polyhydroxybutyrate. You can break those cells open and recover a valuable re resin material that can be used then to make consumer products or you can add fibers to it, make biocomposites and, and various materials here. In the end, all these kinds of products that we make end up back in the landfill, and that's not such a bad thing, right, in this scenario, because we could use that methane to make more of these bioplastic. This material's not toxic, it's biodegradable, and so it doesn't have the harm to the environment that uh, synthetic plastics would have. And uh, this is just showing that when you take the biocomposite, and put it in an anaerobic environment, you can see what the microorganisms do. They first remove all the bioplastic, and then they get onto the hemp fibers that we're using for these biocomposites. And there they are. They look like, I showed it to my uh, kids, and one said it looks like maggots, right? Like maggots covering the fibers. And so you can see there that this is a, a, a very efficient way to uh, recover the uh, value of these resources. 
Then lastly is the nitrogen cycle. And just a couple things about that. Uh, basically, we can think of a, a nitrogen cycle in terms of organic nitrogen or fixed nitrogen and nitrogen in our atmosphere, and then there's intermediates between that, ammonia and nitrate. <clears throat> now, uh, this cycle, before humans got involved, was spinning at this amount, 130 teragrams of nitrogen per year. <clears throat> and then we invented the Haber process. The Haber-Bosch process was invented to feed the world, right? So we take nitrogen from the air and we make ammonia out of it. This process uses about 1% to 2% of the world's annual energy supply, just this one chemical reaction. Uh, the output is 100 teragrams of nitrogen per year. So we were, the cycle was spinning at 130, and now we've just, with one chemical reaction, almost doubled it, almost doubled it. So the result of that is that we short-circuited the process, and we're not keeping up. Ammonia and nitrate and things like that are building up in the environment, and as a result of that, you get things like Lake Taihu in China, where you're fertilizing the lakes, right? And we get these massive uh, uh, algal blooms. And this one, this lake supplies 30 million people. So what do we need to do? We need to go back the other way, back to nitrogen. So here's a, another project then that we're working on. Can we convert nitrogen uh, in the ammonia, for example, to back to N2, where it needs to go? Looks like I'm losing my pointer. Uh, back to N2 in a short circuit cycle. And maybe can we even recover energy doing that? So here's a, here's a reaction we're looking at. That's, for those of you who remember a little chemistry, that's ammonia. And then we're going up to converting it into nitrous oxide. Now, some of you who know about global warming know that nitrous oxide is, and we're using microbes to do that, but nitrous oxide is a bad thing, right? Serious greenhouse gas, 300 times more powerful than CO2. And so what can we do? Well, uh, the rocket scientists here at, on campus, uh, Yaniv Shearson and uh, Brian Cantwell, uh, they've come up with these little decomp decomposition devices for nitrous oxide. So we use microbes to produce the nitrous oxide, use the decomposition cell to break it back down into air and release energy, okay? And so this also offsets some of the oxygen that's required, and this process then uh, produces energy and saves oxygen. So this is, uh, this is why I'm so excited to be here and, and so grateful for the funding that's uh, been, an that been possible through the Woods Institute. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.